And then when I was about 15 or 16, I thought golf is for me, but I wasn't actually a very good amateur. The lowest handicap I got down to was two. <laughs> so that's not really setting the world on fire. So I did a traineeship. Um, I kind of always wanted to play, but at that time I wasn't good enough. So when I was 19, I turned pro. I was off a four handicap when I turned pro. So I actually got worse between 16 and 19. <laughs> Uh, graduated uh, when I was 22 years old and thought, well, I'll, you know, because I was a teaching pro for a few years um, and played pro-am circuits, couldn't really, you know, get my game going, struggled to break 80 for quite a while there. And then uh, I met, uh, I was married young, my wife and I, and, you know, at the age of about, I think, 25-ish, she said, look, if you really want to give this golf thing a go, we need to make a plan. And, uh, and we sort of set something in motion and then I just got better and better and ended up playing here firstly here in Australia, went across to Europe, got my card there and then did well enough in Europe where I got my world ranking down into top 50 in the world and then went to the States. So from a, from a four handicapper, uh, I sort of think I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. So there's a couple of really interesting bits there that we'll dig deeper into. So one that stands out there is uh, the, the chat with your wife. Mm. and and I think for me, that kind of sounds like, well, you better get good pretty soon. Otherwise, maybe we need to look at some other options. Is that kind of how that happened? Pretty much, yeah. Because for, for a couple of years there, you know, I'd be, I'd be working uh, in, in a shop. I was in Perth at Caramar Golf Course, um, working in the shop there, doing things. And then I'd go off and play pro-am circuits, go to South Australia to play the, the circuit there. went to Queensland for a year to play the circuit, uh, Tropo Tour there, which is, you know, you only ever go there once, a lot of people say. <laughs> Uh, played the WA circuits, obviously, and yeah, it was really kind of just meandering through, not with any real direction or path. And I was playing a tournament up uh, in Geraldton uh, in the mid 90s, and I just shot, uh, I can still remember, 82, 86, 88 to finish dead last in the tournament. And my wife and I were in the car park afterwards, and I was in tears basically because I just couldn't, you know, think, how, how bad am I? And, uh, and that was really the that was the catalyst. She said, look, okay, let's make a three year plan, find the right coach, because I couldn't, didn't have anyone that I could really relate to with golf swing wise. I needed to work on my mental game and I needed to get my fitness going. So apart from those three things, I was fantastic. So, <laughs> just my golf swing, my mental game and my fitness. So, um, and that's that like a lot of our members. That's, <laughs> that's right. So I put the wheels in motion. And when you, when you have a plan and a path and something clear to work towards, um, people come into your life at the right time. And that's when I met Neil Simpson, my coach, who mm -hmm. was the uh, head professional at the Mount Lawley Golf Club in Perth. Mm -hmm. uh, we started working together and on our first lesson, he actually watched me hit about 10 balls and he said, you're a pro? Uh, this doesn't look too good. <laughs> so that wasn't very inspiring, but I said, no, I've, I've got a great work ethic. I just need some sort of uh, direction and, and understanding of what I need to do. So he sort of put the wheels in motion there, which was great. And I started working with Neil McLean, who my wife rang uh, the West Coast Eagles to find out who their sports psychologist was. So uh, they said, Neil McLean, so I booked an appointment and then, you know, I went to see Neil and, um, you know, a lot of the stuff I use throughout my career and what's in my book is, is based around the, the fundamentals he taught me and then I kind of added my own spin to it. That's, a, that's um, amazing. So, so it seems like at that point, it's not one of those stories where you had a ton of natural talent, but you were weak mentally. It was kind of... You had a mixture of both where uh, you've got one coach telling you that uh, you're, you're not <laughs> how you will go pro. And then, you've got, and then on the other side, like I need to improve the mental game here as well. Mm. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think growing up, I was, I was actually, I mean, anything with a bat and a ball I can do. I mean, I played baseball. I was very good at baseball. I was actually better at baseball and tennis than I was golf. Like I played state level baseball. I beat state players in tennis. Golf, I didn't even make a state team. So, but golf, the attraction there for me was... The other sports like baseball, soccer and basketball, those sorts of things, I thought, well, I play a good game and we still lose. This sucks. Um, whereas golf and, and even tennis, you could play well and your opponents just beat you on the day. With golf, it was like, it's all up to me. And, and that's really what grew me to the, uh, attracted me to the game. As a youngster, I didn't really have that good coaching to begin with. I, I wasn't taught, I don't think, in the right manner. So mm. I was trying to figure things out my, for myself for quite a while. And, and when I met Neil, he, he had that very old school approach. And I was trying to, uh, attack it from a technical standpoint, which wasn't working for me. I was, I'm a very visual, creative person. And the way he explained things just clicked straight away. Um, and then with Neil McLean, very much so, I just needed some structure. 
and, and processes to follow. And then from there, I knew I could develop it for myself. And, and even looking back at, you know, when I was playing in my peak, I watched maybe some old videos and I go, gee, this thing doesn't look too good. But at the time, I thought I was number one in the world. You know? That's awesome. Brilliant. And that was just the belief that I had. So yeah, I carrying over in a lot of the results that I ended up having. Yeah. Mm, see, that's so interesting. There's so many interesting things there to unpack. And um, before we dig deeper into that as well, I just wanted to ask you, like, with everything going on at the moment, what have you been up to? What are you, any projects, any passions? Like, obviously, golf and I'm guessing tennis are probably on the back burner at the moment. How have you been keeping yourself busy? Well, yeah, I've, um, I mean, before all this hit, because uh, we moved back to Melbourne uh, beginning of last year. Mm-hmm. Before that, I hadn't played full-time for a number of years. I probably stopped playing full-time about five years ago. Yep. And I started mentoring other players um, up and coming in the US when we were living there. I was doing some work with some college players, um, college teams and, and up and coming pros. And I really enjoy passing on my knowledge that I had to them. So when I came back here to Australia, that was kind of the path I wanted to follow as well. And um, I've been helping a few different golfers out, funnily enough, of all levels. Not a couple of pros, but also 20 handicappers. It's funny how it works out. And, and what I tend to help people with is more the mental side, strategy, how to get the ball in the hole as quickly as possible. Um, but I've also started delving into a, creating something which I was doing in the US towards the end there. Uh, I was doing an outing for a company called Merrill Lynch, obviously a big financial company over there. And, and I created these experiences like a tour pro experience, which was a lot of fun where I, I gave them the full works of how to play, think, uh, act, um, you know, any stories they wanted to hear, really create a day which is almost unheard of for the average golfer. And they used it in a corporate sense for their clients. So I used to do it a little bit over there every now and then. Someone might want to treat their husband to a birthday and his mates or something like that. So um, that was something I'm going to get going this year, but then COVID-19 came along and that put a halt to that. So uh, once, once we get back out in the golf course, I'll look at more of that stuff. But at the moment, it's been more in the mentoring players up and coming and, and things like that. And with no golf being played, um, it's been pretty frustrating. So, uh, yeah, walking the dogs has been a very <laughs> fun thing. And doing a bit more writing as well, which is fun. Oh, very good. So we've got a, a second part of the book coming, obviously. Well, the next, <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about it for the last year. Uh, the first one was more about the mental game. The, the, this next one's going to be more about strategy and how to play the game. You know, the art of actually playing the game, how to get the ball in the hole. There'll be some mental elements, there'll be some physical, and, and it's not going to be a technique book. It's just going to be more about how do you turn that 85 into 80 or 75 into 70 and things like that. Yeah, awesome. Brilliant. Um, I'll be definitely getting a copy of that. And now the pressure's on. It's out of the world, so you've got to write it now. There's, there's no turning back. Uh, in terms of golf in general, what, what are your feelings on how golf returns from where we're at right now? Well, uh, as I say, I'm in Victoria, so it's kind of you know, frustrating to see uh, everyone else playing and, and we're not. I, I totally understand why they did it. Um, I'm also a big believer in mental health and how golf can help people. Yeah. Um, you know, I see a lot more people crowded down the supermarket than, um, than on the golf course, I'm sure, with all this, all the uh, restrictions that they can put in, two balls and all that sort of stuff. So, but that's a whole other, whole other thing. But once golf gets going again, I mean, in the US, they're talking about playing tournaments in June. I find that hard to believe, but um, yeah. I'll wait and see. It's going to have an impact on our Australian circuit at the end of the year because if they start cramming events in towards the end of the year, that may affect us as well. But um, uh, at the end of the day, for you know, we're talking at that level, it's 1% of golfers that are pros. The other 99%, I want to get everyone out there playing again and just having fun and enjoying the game. And, and that's what I love to do now is just help people improve. And I can't wait to get back out there. And I think maybe people have just that much more of an appreciation for it. You know, you can take it for granted for, for a lot mm-hmm. of things. And, uh, and now that um, we haven't been able to play as much as we wanted to, or when you get back out there, I think there could be some, some pretty good scores going on because you're going to love the game that much more. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it could be a really exciting time for golf on the reverse side of this, just given that social distancing can be practised quite well for those that maybe you know, don't get football back or basketball back as soon as possible. Might be a really exciting time for the golfing industry as well. That's what we're hoping for. Um, well, we're in a unique position because I think at the moment it's probably the only sport being played in, in other states. Mm. Uh, you know, everywhere else you can't play any other sports yeah. that I know of. Maybe you can have a hit of tennis at some clubs, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, but golf-wise, we're out there playing and, and hopefully we can build on that and really help grow the, uh, grow the game. 
Yep, 100% agree. Just uh, a little bit, a few comments coming through at the moment. We've got the legend Paul Sheehan, King of Japan, calling you a legend, which is great. Uh, then we've got Rory Doran, another one of the great guys going around saying that you are one of the nicest guys in golf, one of the best coaches and corporate speakers he's seen in action. So... Well, very kind, Rory. Thank you. <laughs> There's a bit of love happening right now in the comments, which is great. The Perth golfer, Simon at WA, who's one of your statesmen, um, needs a copy of that right now. So he'll be, he'll be looking forward and probably you've got a pre-order there for the second book too. But <laughs> transitioning over now, I think for the rest of this, I love digging into this. We've spoken a few times and I think what we'll do is we'll also touch on some of those ridiculous moments that you've had in your career as well which that's what i really love about this book there's a few things one it's a short read you can punch through this in an hour or two it's really simple it's easy to follow it's practical but then you've got it's just littered with all these amazing stories of your career and i think i've just highlighted a couple here but we'll start off with what's nearly the first line and i'll just read this out this is from the legendary gary player and it basically says he didn't make the team by hosting major championships or winning many regular events. Instead, he made it by being one of the most consistent players in the world over a long period of time. So very similar to your coach, Neil. Gary Player, one of your all-time legends, has said that it wasn't because of natural talent, but <laughs> there was something there that made it a no-brainer to pick you in the President's Cup team. Can you speak a little bit about your interactions with Gary and what that experience was like? And the consistency aspect. Mm. Yeah, well, it, I mean, first of all, Gary, I mean, an absolute legend. I had him as my captain in two President's Cups in 2005, 2007. And just an amazing guy. I mean, he, he takes, you know, fitness and golf and, and passion for the game just to another level. I mean, he put people to shame doing sit-ups in front of us, you know, crunching and all this, doing push-ups, doing these high leg kicks. He just absolutely loves it. And I've seen, I've seen him do some things that, he doesn't have to do and go out of his way. I remember we were at the, I was playing the Masters one year at Augusta and we're on the range and having a bit of a chat and then he sees uh, a kid on the side standing next to his the parents and the kid is, he's really obese, he's quite overweight. And he goes up to him and he says, you know, this is uh, your son obviously and they go, yes, yes. And he said, well, look, don't take this the wrong way but if your son doesn't change his habits, he's going to be in for a life that's not going to be as fulfilling as what it should be. And he's probably spent 20 minutes to a half an hour talking to him about diet, nutrition, fitness and that. And he probably changed that kid's life. I don't know. Yeah. He didn't have to do that. I mean, so he's an amazing guy in that sense. Um, and I, loved, I just love being around him because that enthusiasm and that passion really rubs off. And yeah. we had a blast. We probably had more fun losing in the President's Cup than the Americans did winning. I know that. <laughs> but, um, going back to the consistency side of things, um, yeah. I think that comes around probably because physically I wasn't the most talented player out there. I knew that early on and I always had a philosophy, even to this day, but going back to when I was playing and practicing and it really related back to the structure and I talk a little bit about it in the book, mm. is how do I get better today? So I woke up every morning thinking I want to be better when I go to sleep at night and when I woke up that morning, how do I structure my day so that I can do that? And and the improvement might only be 0.1 of a percent, but you add up a bunch of those days over time. And I tell a lot of the young players these days uh, the same thing. If you add those days up, you're just going to get better through structuring your day in a manner that will lead to improvement. And then when you add all the other things into it, you're just going to keep climbing the ladder. And my career was very much that way. I only climbed the ladder one rung at a time. I never jumped two or three. Uh, and my game, uh, let you sort of, talking about consistency, was built around that fairways, greens. I was not a long hitter. I had a very good short game. So I was always up there, had a lot of top tens. Mm. But I never had that streakiness, I guess, to, you know, blow a field away. And I had chances to win, don't get me wrong. And other times I was in the lead and someone finished Birdie Eagle to beat me. Uh, I'll never forgive you, Retief Goosen, for doing that. <laughs> but um, so that led to a very consistent career. You know, I think at one point... I was in the US playing over there full time and, and I was getting um, criticised in the media. They said, you're top 30 in the world and you haven't won on the US tour. How can you justify that? And I said, well, I actually see that as a positive because yeah. I must be playing really good golf over a long period of time to do that. They, they're all about wins and, and I get it. I mean, careers are made up on wins. 
The, the, the correct answer there would have been I was a four handicapper just a few years ago. So I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going all right. And it, it's such a like, I think that endorsement from a legend like Gary Player, like to me, if it was me, it would mean more than being, oh, he's got the most natural swing because that's something that is kind of innate, right? Whereas to get that, that acknowledgement that your qualities were mental toughness and stuff that you actually controlled, the actions that you took, that mentality of getting bigger every day. It is something that I think resonates with a lot of amateur golfers and why people love this thing so much is that it's not you talking about how you woke up as a three-year-old and you've been holding a club ever since you were born and just hitting balls. It's, it's more around how the average person can implement some of these things into their life, which I think is really powerful. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you're just trying to get the most out of whatever you have. And some people, that's going to be 15 majors, you know, Tiger Woods. Others, it might be two tournament wins or, or, or whatever. You know, it, it's really it depends on the individual, how much talent they have to begin with. Talent is a very, very common thing. You know, it's, it's a common saying is what you do with that talent, that really matters. So. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned earlier you were, you were mentoring and coaching a couple of these young players. Who are you excited about in Australian golf at the moment? Well, I mean, I've been helping, I guess, the last few years, uh, the last couple of years, Jordan Zunick, um, who was a player who I met a few years ago at the Australian Open. His, his now wife um, reached out to talk to me a bit about his game and the mental game. Talent-wise, you know, he's, it's all there, the entire package. It's more about putting it together and, and getting the mental side of the game going there. Um, so that's someone I've been helping here. But... People that I haven't been helping, I mean, it, it's fascinating to watch all these young golfers come through now. There's just so many of them. I'm super proud of Hannah Green and what she's done. Mm. She's a fellow Mount Lawley member. That's where I grew up playing and that's where she grew up. And she's doing some amazing things uh, on, the, on the women's side of the game. Uh, on the men's side, I mean, Min Woo Lee at the Victorian Open uh, at the start of this year. That was just incredible. I was fascinated to see how he was going to handle himself oh. on that last day. And he just... Looks like we've just lost Nick for the moment. Hopefully his connection will come back and rejoin the call. There you are. I think you're back now, mate. We just lost you there for a few seconds. You were talking about Min Woo Lee and how he handled the big open and kind of cut out. Right. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was fantastic. You know, I was for a young player to watch them, how they handle days like that, because early on, I, I guess when I was coming through, you would see people just screw up on a day like that, you know, because they weren't ready to play. But these young players coming through now, the way they're taught and the way they're brought up and, they're, and the people they have around them that are mentoring and coaching them, they just look like old pros. And, and it was great to see him handle a very, very tough day quite comfortably from what it looked like. And, and his future as well, it's really up to him as to how far he takes it. Oh, there's, yeah, there's some really exciting young players. I think, yeah, you mentioned Hannah and Min Woo there. And, yeah, it's been phenomenal to watch their journey. I know a lot of our community members love following them. And I think it's a ex really exciting time for Australian golf. So it'll be interesting, hopefully, after all of this to see how they'll go. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other end of this, I uh, wanted to just sort of go back. And I remember actually Paul Sheen had commented talking about this too. It's about pivotal moments in your career. And one that stands out from the book is when you were trying to get your uh, tour card, the European tour card in, I think, was it 1998, 1999? Tell us a little bit about that situation and making the cut, how that all happened. Yeah, it was, uh, I was at the Q School uh, in 98. Uh, interestingly enough, I went to the Q School in the US that year, the second stage, and the best thing that happened to me was that I missed because I wasn't ready to play in the US yet. My game really wasn't up to that long high football flight type thing i would have been much more suited to europe and as it turned out i was there at the final stage of q school uh q school is the hardest week of any pro golfer's life um because you're playing for your job the next year mm. and we were it was a six round event uh in, in the south of spain just outside of malaga and uh i was playing the fourth round where they have a, a cut after four rounds they cut the field to the top 60 or 70 two or 300 guys start the event. So then the last uh, two days, everyone's fighting it out for the cards. And on the fourth round, uh, I came to my last hole needing to make a birdie to, to make the cut. And it was a, a par five 
which is reachable for me, so it must have been a short hole. And uh, I was in the greenside bunker and I was standing there going, well, I have to get this up and down to make the cut. And I kind of, everything crystallized in my mind at that moment. I'm like, well, if I have to get it up and down. I think I should try and hold this because that would mean a tap in if it doesn't go in, great. So I really focused on actually holding the shot rather than trying to get it up and down. And finally enough, splashed it out, all trickled down, goes in for eagle. And <laughs> my wife was catting for me. We had a massive hug going, yes, we're into the weekend. I'm going to have some sort of status, whether it be challenge tour yeah. or, or if I can play my way. But that, that spurt, you know, that, that shot, one shot, then uh, the fifth round, I just carved the golf course up and, and really, uh, you know, went towards easily attaining. I think I got the 23rd card. I used to hand out 35 cards at the time. And, and I was out on the European tour the following year. So um, that's, uh, yeah, if that, if that bunker shot doesn't go in or if I don't get it up and down, I don't know where I would have been today. So it was, a, it was a pretty cool moment. That's amazing. And well, you actually, you smoked it in. You, you didn't, instead of birdie, you got eagles. So it was easy. Yeah. Hey, what were you worrying about? But no. that, <laughs> that confidence aspect of, how much of that is internally driven? And then like, what's the impact of the external validation? And I'll clarify that a little bit more, but say there, like you knew what you had to do as you're hitting that shot. What do you think your mindset would have been if you don't make the cut? And how do you then recover from that moment if you don't actually get that result? Well, if I hadn't, have, um, I just would think, okay, well, well, what's next? That was my mentality at that point because everything leading up to that point, I was on a steady climb. I was just getting better every single year uh, since I met the, the two Neils and, and I was really making some, some good progress. When I said earlier, I put a three-year plan into place and I set some goals. I actually achieved those goals within about 12 months or 18 months. Yeah, wow. Uh, instead of three years. So for every, so then I had to reset and keep going. And, and uh, I think I went to the European Q school when I must have been about 27-ish, something like that. Um, and then I sort of kicked on from there. But I think in those moments when you have a situation like that where it's obviously very important, number one, you have to be aware of, of, of how you're thinking. Are you thinking negatively or positively? And I talk a bit about it in the book you can actually use negatives to your advantage um, because when you get to a situation that's quite important, what tends to happen is you start thinking about the result and you go, wow. And the, if you're thinking about the result, it's usually not a good thought because you're thinking about screwing up. In that sense, I was aware enough to say, okay, well, there's a result in front of me. Why don't I turn it into a positive rather than trying to get it up and down? Why don't I try and hold this? Let's, let's really focus in on holding it. And what do I have to do to actually achieve that? So then I went through my process and, and uh, everything sort of worked out in my favour. Now, was it luck? Well, there was a bit of luck involved with it going in, but as Gary Player always said, the harder you practice, the luckier you get. So yeah, That's right. Yeah. Well, luck luck favours opportunity and those that persist, right? Exactly. That's, um, it's brilliant. And um, one of the things that stood out there that you've touched on a couple of times is, is this magical plan, you know, the, the strategy that you mapped out. And what does that look like specifically? Because for a lot of the golfers that we speak to, it's either starting out in golf. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to, the first goal might be, I want to be able to hit the ball and not embarrass myself and just get that yeah. basic swing going. Then it's cracking 100, cracking 90, 80, 70, you know, single figures, whatever it looks like. If you were going to advise, say, an amateur golfer that's maybe just started the game six months in, mm -hmm. how would you map out that sequence of goals? Oh, I, I, I like to put... I don't like too far in the distance goals. You know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in those because you do need something to work towards. But at that particular time, my goals are always end of the year, what do I want to achieve this year? And then I would go, okay, I want to do this, this, and this. This is at a pro level. Um, and then I'd break that down further. Okay, what do I need to work on specifically with my game that's going to help me achieve that? It might be getting better at putting or chipping or driving the ball or, how to hit certain shots. If you're a golfer that's six months into it, um, to begin with, it's going to be more, okay, how do I consistently not top the ball or how do I get the ball airborne every single time or rather than three putting and having 40 putts around, how do I get that down to two putts every hole and have 36 putts around? And then you go, okay, well, if I need to work on my putting, well, let's start with the setup. What are the basics there? And, and how you structure your practice is really, really important. I talk about it in the book we focus so much on technique that we forget the other aspects uh, of being creative and, and of doing some skill drills that aren't based around technique. They're more about 
feeling the game and, and, and being artistic with the game. That's really, really important about it because a lot of the players, again, coming through, they all look very similar. You know, they've all got the same sorts of swings and people are teaching the same things, which is fine. It, it works very well. But on windy days and bad weather and when you're in situations where there's a lot of pressure, you know, it doesn't mean a lot. Um, it's more, okay, how do I dig deep and, and really figure out what I'm made of that will help me get across the line in those scenarios. And, and being creative and a bit out of the box, as I like to say, uh, is really important in those moments. And then the other part about it, especially if you're in the game six months, is have fun, you know, make a game of it. If you go out and do a bit of practice, I like to divide the time up into, into thirds. So if I hit balls for, say, 30 minutes, first 10 minutes, I'm going to work a bit on technique. Okay, I'm working on my grip, my setup. What am I working on in my swing? The next 10 minutes, I'm going to do a bit of fun. I'm going to see how big a slice I can hit, how big a hook can I hit, you know, things like that, just crazy stuff. And then the last bit, the last 10 minutes, I want to make a game of it to put myself under a bit of pressure. I might go, okay, I need to hit three seven irons between those two posts 150 yards away. Can I do it three times in a row? And if I miss, I've got to start again and things like that. So... Every time you get to that third shot, all of a sudden you've got a result on the line and a bit of pressure, which is what you're going to feel out in the golf course when you go out and play. A lot of people don't do that competitive practice on the range, and that's really, really important. Yeah, there's some amazing, amazing bits and pieces there. One of the things that I think happens to a lot of golfers when they're starting is that transition to getting onto course and the, the first few rounds out there. And you mentioned there that those simple goals of this round, I'm not going to try to top the ball or slice the ball or do something like that. For, for those starting out, because it's a, it can be four, four and a half hours, and I think for beginners especially, that embarrassment factor kicks in pretty quickly if they're playing with golfers that have been playing for a little period of time. What's a good way for that beginner golfer to just enjoy that round and to merely play mini games within the, the four hours so they still keep feeling good about the game of golf? Uh, I mean, yeah, you could, for one, you could always just say to your playing partners, look, I'm a beginner. Uh, you're going to see some shots you haven't seen today, you know, kind of lighten the mood a little bit. And they may laugh and, you know, you might say, look, oh, after eight hits, I'm going to pick it up and we'll keep walking and things like that. I think that's always a good thing. You don't want to be out there having 14, 15 shots on a whole while people are waiting for you. Um, learning how to be, you don't have to be a fast player, but you don't want to be a slow player. And that, you know, that probably annoys people more than anything that are, playing with people who are trying to learn the game. It's get over the ball, maybe have one practice swing and go. Don't have four or five practice swing thinking about your grip, your setup and doing all this stuff. I think as a, as a beginner to the game, it's important to work on your technical things when you're on the range. When you're out on the golf course, just have a bit of fun, try and get the ball going up in the air. Don't focus so much on technique, which is a very hard thing to do. Made a lot of people out in the course and you see them checking their grip trying to get the backswing right and all this sort of stuff. Just get out there, give it a rip, have a bit of fun. and Don't even worry about whatever score you shoot. You know, just, I wouldn't even put a goal on as far as that. The more you get into the game, then you'll find, or you might have a day where, oh, I just broke 100 for the first time. How good's that? And then you may go, okay, well, I wonder how long it'll take me to shoot 90. And then you start setting little goals like that. You know, I might give myself three months to do it. What areas do I need to improve on? And that's when the fascinating stuff happens. It's really good. I love that. I hope people watching are taking notes because I think there's some absolutely gold tips there in terms of that gradual improvement and you've made it super clear on how to be able to achieve that. So thanks heaps for sharing. It's a really valuable piece of content. Now, we'll switch gears a little bit. We'll go to another moment. 2006 Australian PGA Championship. What happened? I won. <laughs> won. <laughs> Uh, it was it's funny. People ask me what's the worst moment in golf and what's the best moment in golf. And I said, well, that all happened within an hour of each other. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I came to the 72nd hole, um, the Australian PGA were at Coolum. You know, the, you know, the 18th hole is wraps around the water there. And all I had to do was, was two putt from about 40 feet uh, to win the tournament. I had a three-foot putt in the end to win and, and missed it. And, you know, funny, I wrote a game on the mental... So I wrote a book on the mental side of the game and, and that was a moment that I should have read my own book because I completely screwed up. Um, you know, just started thinking about, oh, I wonder what I'm going to say in my speech and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it. Um, so anyway, I ended up going into a playoff and the first, with Peter Lonard, in the first playoff hole, I've got the exact same putt. But this time, it wasn't to win the tournament, it was to keep the playoff going. And... 
I was talking earlier about being aware and having awareness while you're playing golf. Well, I remember standing behind the putt thinking, well, I screwed up last time. I know exactly what I need to do this time. And I just went on autopilot, knocked it in and didn't really think much of it. I wish I'd have had that mindset the first time around. Yeah. And then in the end, we went four, uh, four playoff holes and I hit, uh, hit it in the back bunker on the fourth playoff hole, all the bunk shot for the win. So it was a pretty <laughs> way to do it. In a way, I'm almost glad that worked out because it was almost, it was such a roller coaster and a massive mixture of emotions. If I'd have just two-putted on the last, I would have gone, yeah, okay, that was a great win. But this way, it was like, wow. You know, it was kind of one of those wins which will always be in my memory bank. So. Oh, brilliant. It's such a good story, that. And, and, and I love that the ending of that story is that you didn't lose, that you did <laughs> on the fourth playoff hole and end up winning. Otherwise, it's a shattering ending. Oh, I tell you, I, mean, I remember Paddy Welsh interviewed me on the green afterwards and uh, one of the comments was, he asked me about how did I regroup? And I said, well, if I didn't win today, I'm not sure I could have got over this one. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to. <laughs> no, it's brilliant, 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 brilliant. All righty. The, I love this bit in the book where you talk about the, a couple of moments with the first hole jitters. And we all experience this, especially when you go play that, that course that's been on the bucket list for a while if you're the amateur golfer, or in your case, it, it might be a hole like the 17th at TPC Sawgrass, I think you mentioned that, or the first hole at the President's Cup. Mm. How does the mere mortal deal with first hole jitters and how do you mm. get into the start of the round in the best possible way? It's, it's, uh, it's always one of the hardest shots, I mean, even at pro level, and, and that's why I wrote a chapter on, first. it's called First Day Jitters, because we suffer the same nerves um it, at a different level um you know because we're playing elite golf and but for the average saturday comp golfer well you're still going to be nervous on the first tee. even when i go tee it up in a tournament and these days i still get nervous on the first i talk about the extreme of it in the book uh was was the first tee at the president's cup where i was playing with tim clark in a, an alternate shot format where you know, one player has to hit off the odd holes, one player has to hit off the evens, alternate shots. A very hard game in, in team format. And we were debating back and forth who was going to have what. And we just said, look, I'll take the odds. You take the evens, Tim. No worries. Walking to the first tee, I actually realised, hang on, number one's an odd number. I've got the first tee shot. So the butterflies start kicking in. Walk out onto the first tee in front of thousands of people. as in Washington, D.C., and on the tee is uh, my captain, Gary Player. Next to him is Jack Nicholas, who was my idol growing up. And then next to them were Presidents Bill Clinton and George Bush Sr. <laughs> I'm standing there going, what the am I doing here? <laughs> uh, and it was at that moment that my knees started shaking, which, you know, I had my hands shake a lot, but the knees, that means you're about to pass out. So, <laughs> so I had to regroup really quickly. And, and the one thing that got you know, me into being able to hit the shot that I did was whenever I get nervous, and this is a great thing for golfers when you play, as you said, that bucket list hole, uh, golf course when you're on the first tee and you've got all these people watching, I always ask myself a question. I said, okay, what do I have to do right now and when you ask yourself that question, it brings your mind into the present moment. You start thinking, oh, okay, well, I need to hit this tee shot down the left side or the right side. Well, how am I going to do that? Uh, this swing, that's, that's the swing feel that I want. Yeah, yeah, I've got all that. And all of a sudden, you start getting into the process. You're not worried about the result anymore. You're not worried about shanking it into the trees or whatever uh, and embarrassing yourself in front of everyone because you stop thinking about the result. You're just focused on how do I achieve what I'm trying to do here? What's the process? What do I have to do right now? And when you get into that mindset, the nerves seem to dissipate. They'll always still be there. And then once you get the shot, you're away. And that happened in the President's Cup. I didn't kill anyone down the sides of the fairways, which was good. And uh, I probably hit the longest drive I hit all year because it went up. The adrenaline was pumping. <laughs> Oh, it's a brilliant tip. What do I have to do right now? And uh, I think we could all use a little bit more of that for sure. You, you, you spoke a little bit about meditation in the book as well. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of it. I've been for the last four or five years. And do you still practice meditation or do you have a technique that you think is a go-to for golfers? I don't do as much as I should. Um, and, and that was, you know, throughout my peak years, I was almost every day. Uh, I found that Probably because I, my emotions at times were just too much of a roller coaster, and I didn't play good golf when I went up and down a lot. When I was more even keeled, uh, is when I played my best golf, and that's how meditating helped me. So, most mornings before I was 
flying. Uh, if it was an afternoon round, I'd just 15 minutes, sit in a chair, either listen to some guy, you know, who's telling you to breathe and focus on certain things, or whatever. I always found it was even good at, at the golf course where while I was walking down the fairway between shots, uh, I'd scan my body, you know, I'd sort of be walking along and I'd go, okay, what's my, what does my forehead feel like? What does my shoulders feel like? What is my chest? And, and you just sort of breathe through all those things. And all of a sudden when you get to your ball, you're actually quite relaxed. So you've actually done a mini meditation as you're walking along. There's, there's a variety of ways to do it. But the whole point is bringing, meditation brings you back into the present moment and it relaxes you. And if you can do that on the golf course, good things probably happen as opposed to, you know, being uptight and very tense and worried about something that's about to happen. Is it a common thing with what you're seeing with a lot of tour players at the moment? Do you think what percentage of tour players would have some tour type of meditation practice, do you think? Oh, to be honest, I don't know. I've never really asked too many of them. Yeah. If uh, people ask me what I used to do, I say, well, this is kind of the things that I would go through. I highly recommend it. Whether they do or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. The players that I've helped, yes, they, they do it. Yeah. The elite level... Do a lot of them do it? I'm not sure. I mean, there was always, Tiger Woods was always talking about, um, you know, he comes from some, there's a bit of Buddhist background in there and some meditative elements there. So, and he, you could almost see him on the golf course being in the zone and almost being in a trance. It was fascinating to watch because his guys would glaze over. Yeah. So, um, and you didn't even know you were there. So. <laughs> and that's kind of the state you can get into when you do meditate. And I know when you're in that elusive zone, that's, that's the feeling you have. You're just really not aware of anything else except what's right in front of you. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. I remember reading somewhere that Tiger Woods is like resting heart rate was something like you can get it down to under 30 or around 30, which is something ridiculous while he was playing around a round of golf. It's, it's crazy. Um, and <laughs> it's probably a pretty good segue into, into Tiger. This, sure. this is always the favourite part of our chats and never, never get tired of you exploring this is talk us through it. You, you mentioned it in the book. Now, for those that don't know, you, you are the only human being alive, dead, present that has, built, uh, that has beat Tiger Woods twice in match play. And talk us through that. Tell us a little bit about win number one, win number two, the moments, the feelings, how it went down. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I never get tired of talking of it, don't worry. <laughs> uh, in, in, in America, it's funny, a lot of people, that, when I was playing over here, they, they didn't even know my name. They just go, oh, there's the guy that beat Tiger, you know, so. <laughs> kind of funny. Um, but the first time was, so it was at the World Match Play 2005, and I had just beaten Charles Howell III on the 19th hole, actually. And Charles was a friend at the time and he, he, he was pretty upset. And I'm like, you know, sorry, mate, I'll, I'll beat you and all that. But he was like, well, you don't know who you're playing? And I said, no, he says, you got a tiger. But oh, okay, you got a tiger next round. I didn't even look, I never used to look ahead in match play as to who I was going to play. I was just trying to beat the guy right in front of me. And um, my caddy and I, you know, I was talking about a plan earlier. My caddy and I sat down the night before and we thought, how are we going to beat this guy? Because he's number one in the world. You know, he's won all these tournaments for a reason. He's the ultimate front runner. And that was the big key because we came up with a plan of, I cannot get behind to this guy. History shows that up until last year's uh, Masters, he'd only ever won a major, either leading or being tied for the lead going into the last round. He never won coming from behind. So I was treating this as the last round of a major, 18 holes, and we're tied. If he gets the lead, I'm kind of screwed <laughs> because he's the ultimate front runner. So the guy, the game plan, pretty simple, was get the lead early, keep the foot down, don't let him back in the match. Easier said than done, obviously. Um, and we tee off on the first hole. And there was also another part to the, to the strategy, but it almost came about while I was playing him because on the first hole, uh, the announcer introduces you know, Tiger Woods, there's a thousand people around, massive roar goes up. My caddy and I, we watch him tee off. And this thing comes out like a cannon. I'd never played with him up until that point. And the sound it made and how far it went was unbelievable. I look over at my caddy and my caddy's going, <laughs> <laughs> watching this ball take off. And uh, I must have been doing the same thing because they announced my name and uh, he's gone, mate, they've called you up, you better go. <laughs> so I was standing there in shock. So it was actually at that point that I made 
the decision, I'm not going to watch him tee off the rest of the way. So whenever he had driver in his hand, I would just face the other way, let him tee off, and away we went. Hitting irons in the greens, putting, I'd, I'd have a look. Um, but the tee off, I was like, nope, not going to watch because I don't want to become consumed by how good he was because he was pretty impressive. On the first green, I've got an eight-foot putt to hard the hole. Now, going on my getting behind to him theory, it's a fairly important putt. <laughs> and I'm lining it up and my caddy's behind me kind of bending over and he whispers in my ear, mate, this is for the match. I thought, okay, big call. Thank you. I wanted to say, yeah, don't shit Sherlock, but I, I didn't. And, um, but my caddy was great at that. He knew that comment would focus me. He, he knew that that would really lock me into the present moment. And I put everything into that putt, hit a great putt, knocked it in dead center. Birdie the next two holes to go two up after three and played great the whole day. Never, never let him back in and I ended up winning uh, three and one. So yeah, right. that was pretty cool. But I didn't think much of it at the time because I had another match to play in the afternoon and it was against Luke Donald and Luke didn't have a chance. I was playing really well. <laughs> wow. So, and and we go to the second one there. Like, say, was there a moment where you, was that the moment where you thought, all right, like, you know, obviously it's for the match, but were there, were there any other moments throughout that match where, that were big and pivotal where you could feel that, all right, I've nearly got him here. Yeah, well, I birdied, uh, what did I do? I birdied the second and third hole to go two up after three. And on the fourth team, my caddy, <laughs> he goes, mate, you got your foot on his throat. Let's keep it there. I said, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Don't <laughs> say that too loud because if a tiger heard that, he would have got nuts. But, um, but I always had that two, three out advantage. I don't think he ever got back to one up. So I was always had him at a distance, which was great. And then on, and even on, well, the 16th hole, I, I was two up with three to play and I had a 20 footer up the hill to win the match. And I'm thinking, yeah, let's bury him right here. And I got so aggressive on it. I knocked it four or five feet past. I'm thinking, oh, you idiot, you know, why did I do that? And luckily, I, not luckily, I focused again, hold that part. So I was two up with two to go and, and I ended up winning 17 and that's why I won three and one. But uh, wow. and throughout that whole day, there wasn't really a moment where I felt he was going to beat me because I always had him at two or three holes up throughout the match. The, the second time was when it got really interesting because uh, this was in 2007, world match player in Arizona. And going into the event, he had won seven tournaments in a row. He was trying to beat uh, Byron Nelson's record of 11 in a row uh, back in like 1945 or whenever it was. And so he was playing pretty good. <laughs> And uh, it was a bizarre start to the match. It was a miserable day, so it was cold. And I know he doesn't like playing in the cold that much because uh, of his back and his body and all that, as, as we're finding out. Um, and he got off to a horrendous start. He was four over through seven, and I was four up through seven just making pass. And I put it down to the fact that I was very intimidating and he was struggling with that, you know. <laughs> Uh, but on about the eighth or ninth, I think it was the eighth hole, he hit this long iron into the par four and he gave it the big finish and the, the, the twirl, you know, the club twirl that he does. And as soon as he gave it the club twirl, the chest went up and started striding. I'm going, oh, no, he's found his game. He's found his game. So, um, and then he just starts making birdie after birdie after birdie. And then I'm just trying to hold the guy back because I've got my four up lead and that's three up down to two up, down to one up, and then I might have got back to two and it was down to one. And in the end, he was, we were square through 16. Uh, he pegged me all the way back. He hadn't had the lead yet, but he got me back to level. And then on 17, I birdied 17 to go one up again. And then on 18, he had a eight foot putt for birdie to send it into extra time. And, and I knew he was gonna make it and he did. So uh, we're back to the level. And then he had his one chance uh, on the 19th hole. Um, I just missed my birdie putt and he had about a five, six footer for birdie, which uh, afterwards he said um, he hit a good putt, but a pitch mark knocked it out the way. So my thinking was, well, you could have repaired the pitch mark, but anyway. <laughs> um, but I was just happy he missed. And, uh, and then I got him on the next hole on the 20th. So, um, so he did have a chance to get me, but, but uh, probably what I'm almost more proud of is in two matches, uh, he, he never had the lead in either of them. So that was wow. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm guessing in that second one, he, he probably hasn't forgotten the loss from no. a couple of years before that. No, no, he, uh, <laughs> he definitely wanted to win, yeah. But, and, and it's interesting with match play, and, and I talk to people about this as well, is my, I have an advantage, uh, even though I'm, I'm a very short hitter. 
But I used to see that as an advantage in match play because I could hit my approach shots into par fours first. Because I'm, I'm always you know, 20, 30 yards be before people. That's obviously not an advantage. But if I'm playing well, I get to apply the pressure. And, and throughout those periods of my career, I mean, I, I used to hit five irons closer than most people would hit their nine irons. So whether I had a five iron or a wedge in my hand didn't matter too much. So I was always applying the pressure. And they always used to think, man, this guy, he just doesn't make mistakes. Because my game, as we said earlier, was built on consistency. So if I could get that lead early, which is really important in match play, get the lead. Get the tee, that's really good, because if you get that first shot away on every hole, you're always applying pressure, applying pressure. When you're trying to come from behind, it's a tough game. It can be done, obviously, but get that lead early in match play and just keep the foot down. Um, it seems like that's kind of his mantra as well. Mm. Most of his wins have come from leading from the front. So it, what I'm reading here is that you're mentally tougher than Tiger <laughs> is what, you, what you're saying. Is that's, that's pretty... <laughs> Oh, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I'd just take one of his majors. I think he's quite happy sitting on his 15. <laughs> but, but it shows you that in that unique situation where it's one-on-one, -on -one where and could could you feel him overreaching or pushing it a little bit harder when you did have that lead that was causing him to call, make more mistakes? Um, yeah, the, the second time, yeah. I mean, I think I might have had him two up after three and, mm -hmm. and then he got pretty aggressive on the next hole when he hit it in the trees and... I was thinking, well, he didn't really need to do that, but he, you know, he took driver, he probably should hit an iron, things like that. So maybe he thought, well, I've got to turn this around really quickly. And then when he did find his game, well, he, he did turn it around, but luckily I had the four hole lead. So, but he, he always figures out a way, you know, I mean, he, and history shows Tiger's actually probably won the most amount of golf tournaments, not with his A game. He's won so many tournaments with his B and C game because he can just figure out a way to get the ball around the golf course and he'll chip and putt and, and then all of a sudden, he'll get a nine-hole stretch where he'll play great and, you know, shoot five, six under for that nine. And all of a sudden, he's got the lead. The rest of the time, he's just kind of hanging around, hanging around. And, and when he does get the lead, then he just doesn't let it go. And that's, that's a talent which is, which is phenomenal. And match play is a little different because, look, anyone can beat anyone over 18 holes um, in the top 100 or 200, 300 in the world. I mean, you can go play a pro-am here in, um, you know, through Melbourne when we come back up again. And you know, guys are shooting 63, 64 in a pro-am. So they can beat number one in the world on any given day. Mm -hmm. um, but to do it twice was cool. So. Oh, amazingly cool. And it's, it's such an amazing story because, as you said, you, you, you did it with those skills that you've mentioned multiple times here. Uh, and and to, I guess the validation that it works at that level against arguably the greatest golfer, athlete, sports person, you know, like who else is in his category? There's yeah. there's Michael Jordan, there's Muhammad Ali, there's Tiger Woods. That's the the conversation, and to have that as part of your story is pretty amazing and special, I think. And with him like, going back to him there as well, like his transformation as a person, because you hear these stories of what he was like early on in his career. What was your experience with him on a personal level? Uh, didn't have much to do with him personally. We we actually, interesting enough, after the second time uh, I beat him in 2007, we were on our way to go live in America. So uh, Arizona was a pit stop on our way to living in Orlando, Florida. And we actually moved into the housing estate where he was living at. And uh, the week after the match play, I went to the driving range to do some practice. The first person I saw on the range is Tiger. <laughs> he turned around and he's gone... I won't tell you what he said, but, you know, he said, uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> the mate, I come to haunt you. Um, but, uh, per, yeah, on a personal level, he didn't really get very close to a lot of the players he was competing against at the time. The older ones, like the Mark Amiris, John Cooks, who were probably a little past his era. Um, yeah, he was friendly with those guys. But the current ones, he didn't really socialise much with uh, many of those tour pros. And I think, you know, with everything that happened and then when we came back, then I think he became maybe a more of a social person and realised that, hey, maybe, maybe I do need to open up a bit more. But how he's changed and transformed is just fascinating. Um, and we, we knew his ex-wife, Elin, very, very well. Mm -hmm. She's a sweetheart, a lovely lady. Through that whole time, um, you know, she, she handled things very, very well because she, she could have made life very hard for him, but she didn't, which was great, you know, for the kids. And, um, you know, I just say, look, he's a phenomenal golfer. Um, mm -hmm. An amazing athlete, just a terrible husband. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and it seems like 
on that personal level. He's, he's, it looks like he, from an outside point of view that he's trying to do that redemption story nearly, right? Because it's pretty consistent that in the early days, you don't hear too many positive stories or memories coming from the competitors or the tour. But nowadays, it seems like that's changing, like with the end of the Masters in 2019, with all the players getting around them and, you know, the, that sentiment, which is hopefully a nice way for him to... Yeah, I think, you know, when I was, well, I was fortunate enough to play in that era where he basically felt invincible. Um, yeah. And, you know, he had that aura about him. You know, I talk about this with other people. People have different auras. I played with Greg Norman and he has that charismatic aura. I've been around Jack Nicholas and he has an aura of greatness. Seve had this aura of creativity and genius. And Tiger had this aura of invincibility. And you don't want to let people in when you have that because you don't want them to think, okay, maybe I can actually beat this guy because when his name went up on the leaderboard, everyone thought, well, we're playing for second place again. Um, and then when everything kind of hit the fan, he actually realised, hang on, I'm not invincible. So that's probably when he realised maybe, you know, I can start letting people in a bit more. And, and the younger players, he can help them because, um, you know, when he was, I guess, captain and assistant captain on some of those president on the Ryder Cup teams and things like that. I'm sure he got closer to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. It was funny a while back. Um, I remember a lot of the younger players used to say, Oh, geez, I wish I played against Tiger when he was in his heyday. And David Duval came out with a comment, oh, the hell you do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't realize how good this, this guy was. And they found out at the masters last year. So yeah, uh, yeah it was pretty I cool. And like, what was the vibe of those tournaments when you go play play with him there versus a tournament where he wasn't there? Yeah, completely different. Um, yeah. In the crowds, the buzz, you always knew where he was because everyone was on that hole watching him, and the rest of the course almost felt empty. Um, you know, when you're in the group in front or the group behind, that's when it got really interesting because people were just kind of running ahead and trying to catch up and. Playing in the group ahead was the worst. Behind wasn't too bad, but ahead, because people were running around and you know they're not there to watch you. They're waiting for someone else. And, and even that second time more so, I think, at the match play that I played with him, I've never experienced crowds like that. It was just, uh, it was amazing. And, and it was funny, they did not want me to win. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. How many are in your corner? I copped some really good abuse that day. <laughs> But that's the beauty about being an Aussie is we really don't care. And you know, I had a bit of, you know, walking from, because there was a long walks in uh, that golf course in Arizona, long walks from the green to the next tee. And I'm just glad my wife wasn't out there because if she'd have heard some of those comments, she might've got into a fight or two. <laughs> so, but uh, no, it was a lot of, I enjoyed that. It was a bit of banter back and forth with the crowd, but you had some pretty weird stuff happening. It probably leads in, I'm just going to look through the comments from the Facebook Live at the moment. And mm. everyone watching, shoot you through your comments. I don't know how you're going there for time, Nick, if you don't mind having a bit more of a chat there. I'm good for a few more, yeah. We've got some good Friday Arvo viewing and there's just so much gold coming out here. We'll, I think we'll dig into a couple of your actual court systems or approaches would be, would be really cool. But one of the questions that came through from David Muspratt, one of our awesome team members out in SA, is was there much banter or are you just keeping on other sides of the fairway with tiger yeah or just in general maybe do a bit of both but mm. well match plays a different boat I, I always tried i didn't really want to let the other guy know how i was feeling or whatever so that's a little different stroke play events yeah there's it, it's interesting how it progresses you know the start of the round guys are chatting quite a bit uh in between shots especially if you're friends with them or you know you, you know them quite well but then as the tournament or the day and the round progresses, you know, through to the back nine or and the Saturday and the Sundays, the, the quiet, the, it gets quieter and quieter. <laughs> the guys are just kind of focusing in on what they want to do. So to begin with, it's yeah, pretty friendly and everyone has a bit of a chat. And, and look, for the most part, all the guys are really good. You get the odd dickhead or two, but you get that in any walk of life, right? So <laughs> I'm not going to name them, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been on the receiving end of a ripping sledge? A ripping sledge against me? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, nah, not that I know of. Uh, it, and that's the thing in golf is you don't really get yeah. sledge much. Um, it's more, more than the them. galleries if they've had too much to, you know, too much to uh, to drink or whatever. I mean, my wife used to hear it in the gallery. She she's it was funny. She 
she got stuck into a couple of guys and they apologized because uh, I think it was somewhere and, you know, they'd been drinking all afternoon. And, and I was on the green, I had my long broomstick putter and a couple of guys are there. And they're going, have a look at this tosser. You know, he's got this long broomstick putter, obviously he can't buddy putty. Look at him, he looks like an idiot and all this. And my wife's standing right next to him and she says, well, if I thought he was an idiot, I wouldn't have married him. <laughs> <laughs> It was like, yeah, you beauty. <laughs> no, I remember being at a football match and that same thing happened. There was a group there talking about one of the players out in the field and then straight away it's like, yeah, I would completely agree with you if it wasn't my son. <laughs> there you go. It's, yeah, the lesson there is be careful with what you say, I guess. Yeah. Uh, now, digging deeper into... And I, I missed this one before. You spoke about him earlier. You're, you're Caddy Wilbur. Uh, tell us a little bit about him and you, you share a story about him with Jack Nicholas in the, in the book, but what was a, a real key moment between say you and Wilbur during your playing career? Oh, he, he's a legend, Wilbur. I mean, yeah, he's, he was just perfect for me. We got on like a house on fire cause I probably spent more time with him than my wife for a number of years there. Um, you know, caddies, you're with them almost seven days a week. Um, and most of the days as well. So, but he, yeah, he's an English guy from Derby, middle of England, and, and we hooked up uh, on the European tour. My wife was my first caddy over there, but she said, look, if we want to stay married, I think we need to find someone else to caddy for you. <laughs> it was uh, 24-7, you know, so, um, uh, so we, you know, she found him. Uh, he just stopped working for a guy called Gary Evans, um, who played the European tour, and, and we said, hey, come on board, let's give you a trial run, and the rest is history, I guess. He was just a great bloke, you know. He, and the art of caddying and what makes good caddies is, is they, they almost have to have an intuition to know when to say something and when not to. Because you can say something, what they think is at the right time, and it's the complete wrong time to say it. He knew when I was playing well, just let me go. I'm like a racehorse, just let him go and, until I ask. I don't even bother saying anything. And then there are other days where I'm really struggling and he knew that, okay, we've got to start having a chat, you know, try and take my mind away from the game. He was really important in that sense. Talk a bit about in the book about switching off between shots. It's, it's actually a very underrated skill. And what a lot of golfers struggle with is those between moments as you're walking down the fairway, how do you take your mind off the game? And for me, with Wilbur, my caddy, we'd talk cricket, football, soccer, you name it, just depending on what was on at the time. He was English, so we could talk a lot, a lot of cricket most of the time. It wasn't fun when uh, England beat Australia in the Rugby World Cup, I know that. But, um, uh, but we had you know, so much fun, and he was just a, just a great bloke. No, that's awesome. Really. Was there ever a time where you were like, come on, Wilbur, what was that about? Like, that was way off, wrong decision? No, yeah, he gave me the wrong club once. And, and <laughs> when I say wrong club, it was actually the wrong club because we're playing in um, playing the Italian Open. And it was the last event before the Volvo Masters, which is like their tour championship. And I needed to shoot a ridiculously low number this day to get up into the top five or something to, to make the Volvo Masters. And on the second hole, I said, uh, yeah, give me the, um, give me the five wood. And he gives me the five wood. I hit the shot just dead at the flag. I mean, it was pure. Came out a little low and I thought, that was a bit weird. Came out a bit lower than I thought. Flew the green, ended up making bogey. And um, at the time, I put new fairway woods in. So my three and my five wood were new and I hadn't really adjusted to them that well. And after the round, my wife said to me, um, actually, Wilbur came up to me and said he gave you a three wood on that whole night. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually giving me the wrong club. So, but, you know, at the end of the day, I probably should have checked the bottom of it, but I just assumed he gave me the five wood. But I think he may have had a couple of reds the night before, so I don't know. <laughs> I played great that day. I think I shot nine under with the bogey. So um, I didn't quite make the Volvo Masters, but it's okay. I let him. <laughs> After round beers on Wilbur that day, for, yeah, exactly. for, for sure. But hey, that, that's awesome. Um, going back to the book a little bit, uh, you, you speak about the pre-shot routine mm -hmm. and what that looks like. Again, we'll go to the perspective of the amateur golfer. Yep. What's a good pre-shot routine? Well, it's... Uh, I'm a big believer in having some sort of a system that before you hit a golf shot, you have 30 seconds or so, let's say it's 30 seconds. What do you do in those 30 seconds that allows you to be in the best possible physical and mental state to hit a good golf shot? Um, what I find with a lot of people is they're over the ball and they're still thinking about what they're trying to do. 
So a good pre-shot routine, I like to divide into two parts. The first part, which is probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 seconds of it, uh, is to decide on the shot you want to hit. You know, what club is it? Where do I want to hit the ball? What sort of a shot? All that sort of stuff. Make a decision and then very importantly, commit to it. Don't be indecisive because when you get over the ball and you're indecisive, you're not going to hit a good shot. The next part of the routine is what I call the execution part. And that's almost like an autopilot. You know, that's kind of get over the ball, take one look, two looks, however many you take. I take a waggle in my swing. Uh, try and make that part of it as consistent as possible. I'd rather people take longer with the decision-making part. Okay, where's the wind coming from? What do I need to factor in? Take your time, yeah, that's fine. But when you walk into the ball and hit the shot, try and make that as consistent as possible so you're not really thinking. You're just not in the zone, but you may have one swing thought. I love to have one swing thought because you need to focus your mind on something, not two or three or four or however many you may have for the day. Just try and make the swing thought very simple. Mine over my career, I had two swing thoughts that I alternated between. One was complete the backswing. And when I felt as though my backswing was nice, the other one was just hit through the ball. I mean, that's as simple as they get. As opposed to, well, I want to get shaft on a 45 degree angle back here and rotate my left wrist. And <laughs> none of that. <laughs> um, it's more just a golf. The, the interesting thing about golf, where it's different to other sports, is you have to create the shot. You have to move the ball yourself. Uh, every other sport, you tend to react tennis, football, baseball, soccer. You're always reacting to a moving thing. Golf, the ball's stationary. That's why in other sports, people really struggle with, for instance, in football, set shots on goal mm. because they're stationary and then they've got to start, you know, slow movement. That's completely foreign to the rest of the game when you're running, you know, guys kick so much better when they're on the run in football. Penalty shots in soccer. Um, people struggle with that a lot because it's stationary ball and they've got to move it. In the flow of the game, there's no problem. Um, golf, we deal with that all the time. So having a consistent routine that helps you Getting that state the best every time is a good way to go about it. Now, finding the routine that works for you is key. I, I love watching, you know, the tour events on TV and everyone's got a different routine. You know, um, Justin Rose sort of lines the club up. Um, Tiger Wood takes all these nice, low, uh, slow swings, feeling something. Rory McIlroy is kind of bouncing into the ball. And, you know, Seve was great to watch his routine. He'd be like stalking his ball like, you know, predator. It's just fascinating. Uh, shark you know he's sort of in there and all this sort of stuff Brooks Kepka and Scotty there's all a variety of routines I always say to people just do what works for your personality if you're kind of a, a conical easy going guy like a maybe a Dustin Johnson you watch him kind of meander into the ball um, someone like a Brant Snedeker is a bit more bouncy and fiery or Jordan Spieth you know and um, they're a bit more upbeat sort of thing so work to your personality with your routine awesome and there's so much gold in there. A big question would be for me is, and I love doing the, the kind of 80-20 rule of most things, where do you find it? So if you're going to say to your 10 or 15 handicapper, mm -hmm. this is the 80-20 rule of pre-shot routine and start from here, what would those steps look like? So I've just hit my ball into the fairway. I'm taking the next shot. Mm -hmm. Ali, what do you do? When you get to the ball? Yep. Oh, okay. Like as soon as that shot's been hit, or whatever you would, when, when, I guess the good question is there is, when do you start the pre-shot routine? So after I've hit a shot, I'll, I'll sort of take you through one shot to the next shot. After I've hit a shot, I go, oh, okay, yeah, that was good. What was bad? You know, it's okay to analyze it. That's fine. And then I switch off. I take the Velcro on my glove. I give it a rip and I switch off. I start talking to my caddy, my playing partners, looking at other things, whatever. Try not to think about what's coming up. Really important. Very hard to do though, let me tell you. <laughs> um, what I tend to do is when I'm within 10 to 20 yards of the ball, then I start, I have wide focus, sort of taking in everything. And as I get to the ball, then I'm starting to narrow my focus. Okay, I can see the ball there, yep. First thing you do is check out the lie. The lie is massive. The lie dictum, uh, dictates a lot of what's gonna happen. Is it in a divot? Is it sitting up? Is it in the rough? How's it gonna react off the club face? Figure that stuff out first. Next thing I like to tell people is rather than do this, get a yardage, the laser actually stand there look at the flag and go what sort of shot feels right okay does it feel like a six iron a seven iron does it feel like a fade a draw a high a low what feels right if you do this straight away that 
puts a preconceived number in your brain and you're thinking, well, it's 140 metres, that must mean it's a six iron. Now, it hasn't taken into the fact that you might be uphill, you might be downwind, you might be early in the morning when it's cold, the line might be a bit shaggy, it might fly. It doesn't take into any of those considerations. So I always tell people, look at the shot first, feel, okay, yep, make a decision on that, feels like a seven iron, then get your number and then see if those two relate. Mm. And that's really, really important. From that, once you've made your decision, what I like to do is stand behind the ball, pick a target that I want to start my ball at, take one practice swing, just kind of feeling that swing thought that I was talking about before, just feeling that, walk into the ball and everything from there is on that pilot. I take two looks, have a waggle and go. Some people might just take five looks. Playing partners might not enjoy that. Some people take one look. It's really up to yourself as to how fast you go with all that part of the routine. But before that, it's that kind of in a nutshell is, is a pre-shot routine, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's super simple. And I think the beautiful thing about that is we talked about slow play before. Hmm. That's happening pretty quickly. Yeah. Right? It, yeah it's not right. taking much time. Yeah, it's pretty much like the actual actions are a couple of practice swings. Yeah. And then... Yeah, a couple of looks and off you go, right? Yeah. What tends to happen with most people is they haven't been very clear on that decision first. So they're, as I said earlier, they're over the ball and they're going, yeah, I'm not sure if this is the right club. Maybe, what if I hit it right? Oh, and they start looking and start getting out of a routine and there's no rhythm to it. Another part that I highly recommend golfers is, I talked earlier about, because it's a stationary ball, you have to create the shot. You almost want to feel as though you react to the shot. And what I mean by that is, is when you take your last look at the target, back to the ball, go. As opposed to look, back to the ball, back to the ball, and then go. You lose all sense of rhythm and feel. Whereas if you just boom, 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 and you react, the game becomes much simpler. Perfect. Love it. Very, very good. Just having a look if there's any more <laughs> coming through. That was, yeah, super simple. And I think that it's such a practical tip that uh, who knows what the swing is going to do, but every single golfer can implement some type of consistent yeah. pre-shot routine. So my focus when I was playing was all I wanted to do was have a quality pre-shot routine on every single shot. And if I did that, there's nothing more I could do. If my swing's on, my swing's on. If my swing's off, well, so be it. But whatever I've done for that day, that's the best score I can shoot if I commit to doing a quality routine every time. And that's what every golfer should aim for when they get out there. Awesome. Just looking through a few of the comments coming through. Alan McQuaid, Nick, you're a legend. I'm also a lefty and spent many hours with Neil Simpson, such a nice man. Yeah. Uh, Dale Fitzgerald, did you just call yourself a 10 handicap, Riley? ISO has served you well. Uh, yeah. Definitely not. But maybe with the pre-shot routine, I can one day get there, Fitzy. I think I'll be about a 30 handicapper after this. <laughs> um, awesome. And I think now, mate, we'll, we'll finish off just with some rapid fire Down questions. Let's Down go through. with the best player that you ever saw, played against with, and why. Oh, geez. That's a tough one. Um, well, you know, Tiger, obviously, um, that I played with. Um, no, I played with Norman, you know, probably the most impressed I've ever been with someone's ball striking. Now, I played with Norman in 98, uh, had his tournament, the Greg Norman Holden International uh, in Sydney. And for nine holes, he, he shot 30 for nine holes and he lipped out twice. It was probably, possibly the greatest display of ball striking I've ever seen. <laughs> Unbelievable. So the shark. I mean, there was thousands of people going nuts as well. So that was pretty cool. That's amazing. Um, and on that, the dream four ball. Who is it? Why? Oh, yeah, you mean people. Well, I was a massive fan of Jack Nicholas growing up. Never got to play with him. You know, I had conversations and everything. That was great. Same with Peter Thompson. Would have loved to have played with Peter. Never did. Um, and then have to throw the old man in there as well. You know, so it would be fun to have uh, me and Dad could take on Jack and Peter. That'd be a fun match. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty good four ball. Uh, yeah. I think I think anyone would would enjoy that one, and the fact that you the old man's got got the the shout there to have a hang out with Peter Thompson and Jack. Exactly, not yeah. a bad treat. Your biggest failure throughout your career, and how did you overcome it? Biggest failure? Oh gosh, I hate looking at failures. Um, uh, or challenge. Challenge. Reason. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. You know, something stick in your mind. I beat that time. I beat uh, Tiger Woods. 
uh, the second time. The next match was against Henrik Stenson, and I had a one-up lead with two to go, and I finished bogey, bogey, and lost. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember that for some reason. My caddy does too. He said, how the hell did you give that away? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I just gave it to him on a platter, and Henrik went on to win the tournament. So he yeah. should thank me. So that was, that, that was a tough one to take. You know, I've had other ones where people have just beaten me or, you know, I might have screwed up, but it's, it's not that big a deal. But that one, for some reason, sticks in my mind. Yeah, awesome. Um, a big one that we're really passionate about is promoting the game of golf and especially getting non-traditional golfers into the sport. Do you have any messages for, for people that maybe haven't tried the game, looking to get into the game, maybe one or two years earlier in their journey about how mm. to approach it? Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is, is have fun. Um, you know, I, as a kid growing up, the earlier you can get kids into the game of golf, the better it is because it's such a lifetime sport and it teaches you all these different um, principles that you're going to use, obviously, throughout, your, uh, throughout your, your, life, your life. Basically, it's interesting, you know, living in America, other sports like baseball and football over there and, and all these other things, they're trying to get away with stuff all the time. Almost cheating is not a bad thing, whereas in golf, you just don't do that. So, so it teaches you those life lessons, which is really important. Now, how you get into it, I'd, I'd, be, I'd love to see more nine-hole golf and some nine-hole events just for a bit of fun. You know, they're doing those um, top golf things in the US now with the driving range competitions. That's quite, uh, that's quite good. Um, but the other part about it is when you do go out and play with your mates, always have a bit of a, a bit something on the side. That ends a nice competitive element to it, you know, whether it be for a drink or 10 mm -hmm. cents or something like that. I'm not promoting gambling, but, um, you know, it's always nice to have that competition. That's why I love to play the game. Yeah, I love that bit. Uh, we, we were talking about it a little while ago, that just how fun even a dollar a hole skins is. Yeah. Yeah, just to keep you in there, if you if you're having a bad round, it still keeps you engaged and yeah, exactly. I'm I'm funnily enough, I'm involved with a company in the US called Dollar Dollar Dollar. Just that dollar the yep. front, dollar the back, dollar the match. Yeah, awesome. And uh, we're trying to do a mobile um, an app based around that. And, um, it's very it's, it'll be popular one day. So uh, a lot of fun because I grew up doing that playing as a kid, and it's and that's what sort of drove me in the beginning to really get that competitive element going. Yeah, awesome. Very, very cool. And then just finishing off, where can people find you? We've obviously got the book that <laughs> anyone that's been watching this live, do yourself a favour, get a copy of this. It is one of the best golf books going around. I think, you know, there's two or three in, out there that I think they're always highly recommended and touted. And your book now is definitely in that list. I think it, I'm putting it at number one. So cracking read. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, as, as I said, uh, it's, it's fairly simple and easy read. I didn't want it to be too mind numbing. That's why I tried to put a lot of stories in it because I kind of related it to my career and what worked for me. There's some positive things in there and there's also some negatives because I screwed up a few times as well. So um, maybe that's why people relate to it because it's based around stories. It's always more interesting to hear stories. Um, but yeah, I'm around uh, in Melbourne these days, doing a bit of corporate outings, uh, a bit of speaking, as you mentioned, uh, a bit of mentoring. Um, I have a website, nickohern.com, if you ever want to get hold of me. The uh, email's on there. If anyone ever wants a book, you can either go through Amazon or just shoot me an email and I'm happy to mail and sign one out to you and uh, you know, hopefully it'll help with your game. Yeah, brilliant. Well, again, just thank you so, so much for being so generous with your time. That was a pretty long sesh. Should have had that glass of wine, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you definitely should have got that glass of wine. <laughs> Again, we just appreciate you sharing so many amazing stories and just the gold in terms of the tips and everything that, yeah, you, you've noted down, obviously, in the book, but that you're also so open and willing to share here. And, you know, yeah. I think you've really touched, we'll scratch the surface there. There's so much more detail that is in the book there too as well. So You never stop learning in this game, that's for sure. I mean, uh, we were talking earlier. I'm, yeah. I'm started writing another one and uh, it'll, it's going to take quite a while to write another one, but it'll be a bit different. Not so much about the mental game, more about how to score and things, mm -hmm. and different elements. So uh, I just love sharing what I know and, and I love learning along the way. That was one of the things I always try to do was learn from other players and see what they did. Yeah, perfect. It's one of those fascinating games in that sense. And even now, it's just such a perfect opportunity to, to learn those things with the limited distractions, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm writing at the moment. I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be some great art created throughout this period. 
I yes. Think. Yes. Well, my wife's an artist. You can sort of glimpse a bit here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah so we were going to have an exhibition for it just before COVID nineteen hit, and uh, it's, it's now going to be the end of the year. So we'll oh, see. awesome! Maybe maybe shift the camera around a bit. Show, yeah. show us a little bit of the art. Oh, we'll give yeah. that away for the comments. This is a famous one, Frida. Um, Frida. Very Frida. nice. Yeah. Beautiful. She did a bit of an Aussie slang one uh, the other a little while ago. I don't know if you Walk and furries. Brilliant. Yeah, and furries. <laughs> America, and we wanted to sort of show our American friends uh, you oh. know, what, uh, what the Aussie slang is. So. Well, that's a, that could become a really famous cultural piece. <laughs> on the it's and genius. A couple more portraits. Of, this is her yin and yang. So. Ah, beautiful pieces. Uh, they're massive too. They're just huge. So um, anyway. That's where the natural talent lies in the family. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah we've got the Archibald that she's entering as well. So it'll be, uh, it'll be fun. Oh. Um, well, good luck. Good luck with that. Hopefully you can get out, having around, getting back to the corporate outings, the speaking again as well. Um, everyone that's commented as well has just mentioned how good you are in that space. So and just again, massive thank you, Nick. And hope you're you have welcome. a great weekend and that we're all back out there. Dustin, all right. Cheers, good. mate. I'll go get that glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Cheers. Right. See ya. Bye.